I'm Sophia Besch, and this is The World Unpacked. In the late hours of Saturday, Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles in an unprecedented direct attack on Israel. There was limited damage as Israel and its allies intercepted most of them before reaching Israeli airspace. Now, the United States and allies have urged Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to show restraint in its response and avoid further escalation. But with the conflict in Gaza still ongoing, this latest attack from Iran is causing many to fear that a wider regional war is coming. Joining me today to unpack this is my colleague Karim Sajadpour. He's a senior fellow in the Middle East program here at Carnegie and one of the leading experts on Iran. And I'm thrilled that he is now my very first guest on The World Unpacked. Karim, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sophia. It's lovely to be with you. So, Karim, let us in this first half of the show begin by unpacking what has happened before we move on to what comes next. We were all holding our breath over the weekend as the attack played out, waiting to see first how effective Iran's missiles would be and then how Israel would respond. We are now a few days on from the Iranian attack. Can you begin by just giving us the headlines on what do we know now and what do we not yet know about the attack and what came next? So I think maybe we could start anywhere historically, but let's start with April 1st of 2024. And that was the day in which Israel assassinated several senior Iranian Revolutionary Guard commanders in Damascus. Um, there's contradictions as to whether these officials were in a diplomatic location in, in Damascus. And uh, April 13th, I believe it was, almost two weeks later, Iran launched an unprecedented attack on Israel. It was unprecedented in that for 45 years, Iran has been fighting Israel. But this is the first time it launched attack from Iranian soil against Israel. And there's also some dispute about the nature of this attack. I think when I speak to White House officials and military experts, they'll say, listen, the nature of that attack when you're launching Uh, uh, hundreds of drones and a hundred ballistic missiles, which is very serious, that's meant to be a very destructive attack. It wasn't meant to be merely symbolic. Um, you have uh, 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 certainly the Iranian government's narrative and, and analysts uh, sympathetic to that narrative was that Iran long telegraphed that they were going to be launching this attack against Israel. It could have been far more deadly. They could have unleashed Lebanese Hezbollah against Israel. So so that is also disputed. Now the ball is in Israel's court. And I think the Israeli uh, leadership has made clear that um, they are going to retaliate. It's not a question of whether, it's just a question of when. And they have a large menu of options uh, that they can use against Iran. They can choose to launch attacks against Iran's nuclear facilities, against its military installations. They could use cyber attacks against Iranian critical infrastructure, against Iranian oil facilities. They could continue assassination. So I think that Iranian leaders are, are not likely to be sleeping much these days. So, Karim, I've heard you say before that Israel and Iran are unnatural adversaries. That might sound strange in the ears of our listeners because we've gotten so used to this uh, rivalry. But historically, could you just frame this, uh, these two countries' relationship? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. It's an important question. And the reality is that, in my view, Iran and Israel are not natural adversaries. So look at the conflicts in today's world between Israel and Palestine, between Russia and Ukraine, China and Taiwan. Uh, in most cases, there are uh, direct bilateral disputes between these countries, whether it's over land or resources or historic identity. None of that exists in the Iran-Israel context. These are countries which are a thousand miles away. Um, in my view, they have actually compatible national interest. Iran um, as a vast energy producer. Israel needs energy. Israel is a technological superpower. Iran needs technology. And there's also an historic affinity between these two peoples, between Persians and Jews. Um, in the Old Testament, Cyrus the Great, the ancient king of Persia, is revered for freeing the Jews from, from uh, Babylonian captivity. And it wasn't until 1979 and the 1979 Iranian Revolution when the country transformed almost overnight from a U.S. allied monarchy into a viscerally anti-American dictatorship led by Ayatollah Khomeini. And from 1979 to the present, opposition to Israel 
and opposition to the United States have become, I would say, the two most powerful sources of identity for the Islamic Republic of Iran. And from 1979 to the present, uh, Iran has really gone after Israel via its proxies. Um, and it has created a, a quite a formidable proxy network uh, in the region. Uh, I think first it's useful to talk about Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, Lebanese Hezbollah was spawned in part because of the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon. And since then, I call it kind of the McDonaldization of Hezbollah. You know, they've, Iran set up a branch in Lebanon, and they've set up franchises throughout the region. So you have the Houthis in Yemen, you have Shia militias in Iraq, you have the Assad regime in Syria, which uh, Hezbollah played an inc- uh, important role in, in preserving them, um, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And now Iran is, I, I think, um, you know, arguably the most powerful country in today's Middle East, and that they are dominating five Arab lands, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, and Gaza and the Palestinian territories. And so when I look at this Iran-Israel conflict from a historic perspective, it's, it's tragic because I think these two peoples are not natural adversaries. Now, when you're looking at it through a military perspective, uh, Israel clearly outmatches Iran. Israel is a nuclear power, uh, superior mir- military capabilities. So Israel is Goliath and Iran is David when it comes to the military capabilities. When you're looking at it from a geographic perspective, Iran is Goliath and Israel is David. Uh, Iran is more than 70 times the size of Israel. It's surrounding Israel with its regional proxies. And that's why this uh, a full-blown a full-blown conflict between these two countries would be, um, in my view, disastrous for both nations because um, Israel is, is is very small, and it you know it would be very difficult for Israel to be on the receiving end of tens of thousands of of, of rockets and missiles, not only from Iran but. From its not too distant neighbors, uh, 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 from southern Lebanon, where Hezbollah is located, and likewise um, as a nuclear power, if this escalates, um, you know I, I don't want to um, uh, uh, create a doomsday scenario, but if the leadership in Israel at one point feels that their existence is at stake, um, that may be something they would be willing to do. Okay, I think this is a really, really useful framing that you've provided there, looking at um, the two adversaries from a geographic perspective, but then also from a military perspective. And I want us to talk about both. Um, Maybe first, just from a military perspective, I think it's really important to clarify because we have heard so many different interpretations of what this Iranian attack means and the scale of it. Do you think that the fact that Iran sent advance warnings has only attacked military targets, um, clearly hasn't really uh, had much of an impact in terms of damages in Israel with this attack. Is that a sign of Iranian restraint or Iranian weakness? So your, I guess she's your compatriot, Hannah Arendt, the great German-American thinker, writer, philosopher. There's a line in one of her writings, which I've always remembered, and she said, even the most radical revolutionary the day after the revolution becomes a conservative. Why? Because suddenly you're not uh, you're not opposing something. You've you've got you've won something, and you have something very important you want to conserve to preserve. And that certainly applies to the Islamic Republic of Iran. You know they have this revolutionary outlook, but they also have this vast nation state and vast resources, energy resources, which they're controlling, and. Iran's current supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, is going to be 85 years old this summer. He's probably the longest serving dictator in the world. And you don't get to be the longest serving dictator in the world if you're suicidal, right? He, he, he wants to stay in power. And so for that reason, Iran is in the past, you know, they, they are usually um, pretty effective in reading red lines, which is, okay, we're going to, we're going to, we're committed to our ideology. They're committed to their ideology, opposing America, opposing Israel. But whenever they fear that their existence is at stake, whether that's 
uh, existential angst because of, a, because of a military threat or existential economic angst because of sanctions, they usually tend to back down. I think in this instance, there was few audiences they had in mind when they chose to retaliate against Israel. Number one, obviously, they wanted to send a signal to the Israeli government that you cannot continue to assassinate our senior officials and get away with it. They wanted to obviously um, uh, restore deterrence against Israel. Number two, I think Iran wanted to send a signal to their Arab proxies and to the Arab and Muslim street uh, in order to save face because over the last six, seven months, you know, we've seen what Israel has done in Gaza and uh, the Arab world and the, obviously Iran's proxies are outraged as a result of that. And Iran really hasn't done much aside from uh, uh, publicly denounce Israel. And so I think they want to save face uh, with their regional proxies in the Arab street that we can also, we also have the capacity to retaliate. And number three, Iran is a very unpopular dictatorship with its own people. Last year, we saw the women life freedom protests in Iran, which persisted over six months. And like any unpopular dictatorship, this is a government the Islamic Republic of Iran, which wants to be feared by its own population. And so if Israel is taking out Iranian military commanders and Iran simply reacts by sitting on its hands, not doing anything, the government of Iran could fear that this may embolden um, their opposition, their population against them. So I think there was more than one audience for this. And ultimately, um, it remains my view that this is a government which... It wants to stay in power. It's committed to its ideology, but it's even more committed to staying in power. And the parameters I've thought about for a long time now about Iranian retaliation is if they if they fail to retaliate or if their retaliation is too weak, they risk losing face. If their retaliation is too aggressive, they risk losing their heads. And in this instance, um, I think that on balance, I, I'm not sure if this uh, uh, attack against Israel had the intended effect and in that they want they 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 sought to deter uh, future Israeli attacks against Iran. And I don't think they've they've succeeded in achieving that. I think it's a matter of time before Israel goes after them again. OK. So I want to look a little bit more at how the greater Middle East region is responding, reacting to this attack. You mentioned that there were several audiences, um, one audience being Iranian proxies in the region, the axis of mm -hmm. resistance. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how they have perceived and responded to the attack? It's difficult to speak about the so-called axis of resistance as as a whole because, you know, the, the, they're They're somewhat diverse. They all share the same ideology, right? They want to evict America from the Middle East and replace Israel with Palestine. But each of them are in different situations. So obviously all of them um, supported uh, Iran's attack. Um, they all uh, you know, sing from the same uh, hymn sheets. Um, but the most powerful of these proxies is Lebanese Hezbollah, and they also happen to be the one that's uh, uh, perhaps closest to, uh, you know, they're on Israel's uh, northern border. And at the moment, you know, Hezbollah didn't really choose to involve itself in this latest attack. Um, and, you know, we know that Hezbollah has more than 100,000 uh, uh, rockets um, that are well within reach of Israel. And what's happened over the last decade is that um, 10, 15 years ago, um, Iran didn't really have drone technology and it didn't really have precision missile technology. That's changed. And so whereas in the past, when Iran or its proxies would launch these things, they'd rarely hit their targets. These days, they become much more uh, precise. So far, Hezbollah, as I said, hasn't Uh, involved itself because, you know, they're in a country, Lebanon, which has been experiencing an economic meltdown, and they they worry about their popular standing in Lebanon if they uh, involve themselves in a conflict with Israel, and then Israel does to Lebanon what it's doing now to Gaza. I would say on the other end of the spectrum are the Houthis in Yemen, 
which are kind of the newest of these revolutionary proxies, right? The other proxies in some ways are have are experiencing middle age. And in middle age, you may mellow out a little bit, but the Houthis still have kind of the adolescent the exuberance. Of the young. Yes, the v- revolutionary vigor of the young. And I think that, you know, the other thing that these proxies have in common is a total disregard for the well-being of their own societies. So they're far more committed to eradicating Israel than they are, you know, the prosperity and security of their own people. And I expect in the coming weeks what we will also see are Houthi attacks uh, on Israel. Uh, the Houthis have been active in, in disrupting uh, 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 trade, uh, including you know uh, uh, disrupting U.S. trade. Um, and, and I suspect that one of the things that they will do, um, and Iran could well do as well, is go after uh, Israeli targets that may not necessarily be inside Israel. So in the past, Iran has gone after uh, Israeli embassies in places like Georgia, the country of Georgia, and India, and Thailand. Um, Iran has attacked what they call uh, soft targets. You know, it's um, busloads of Israeli tourists in Bulgaria, Jewish uh, community center in Argentina. I think Iran may involve its proxies in these kinds of attacks. You know, what was uncharacteristic of the attack that Iran launched against Israel was that it was highly telegraphed and um, it was obviously done from Iranian soil. How Iran tends to operate is with the element of surprise uh, and, again, via proxy. So I expect that that's what we will see more of in the future. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, come back to and prompt you to talk a little bit more about the options that Iran uh, Mm -hmm. has now. But I want to look first at the role of other Arab states um, in the region and the role they've played over the weekend. Publicly, they've been fairly quiet. You know, we've had some calls for restraints. There have been some reports that, for instance, Saudi Arabia provided assistance to um, Israel's allies. Um, Jordan is one of the most interesting and most exposed cases, I think, because it has publicly acknowledged its role in shooting down Iranian missiles and drones in its airspace. At the same time, of course, Jordan and the other Arab states have been very, very critical of Israel's actions in Gaza. So can you just help us understand the difficult position that they're in right now and their motivations? Yeah, all of these Arab neighbors of Iran and Israel are in pretty precarious situations, uh, including the government of Jordan. So On one hand, their populations, they're not sympathetic to Iran, but they're currently enraged with Israel. And so um, I think that um, a lot of Arab publics uh, wouldn't mind seeing or would be happy to see Israel get a bloody nose. Arab governments, on the other hand, and again, we can't generalize, but uh, certainly U.S. partners like Jordan, Saudi Arabia, UAE, they don't fear Israel as an existential threat. They fear Iran as an existential threat. You know, in some cases, Iran has lodged direct attacks on those countries. Not that long ago, Iran attacked Saudi oil installations uh, uh, in Abqaiq, Saudi Aramco, in 2019. Um, it's gone after um, airports in the United Arab Emirates via its Yemeni proxy, the Houthis. Um, there's a there's a lot of intelligence that Iran is trying to foment unrest uh, within Jordan right now. So those governments are in a precarious situation. On one hand, they would like to see Iranian power downgraded. At the same time, they know that in the event of a, a full blown conflict between uh, Israel and Iran. It then becomes a forest fire, and they're very likely to 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 catch on flames as well. And um, you know, as I said, uh, there there is a history here of Iran going after uh, America's Arab uh, partners, and so I think very few, if any, Arab countries would welcome a war between Iran and Israel. I think the country which may welcome. Um, that and in broader instability in the Middle East is Russia and the possibility of of the United States getting entangled in such a conflict. 
We're going to take a short break now, and in the second half of the show, we will look at what comes next and the repercussions of Iran's attack on Israel. Carnegie has just released Barbecue Earth, a great new podcast miniseries exploring the intersection of meat, climate change, and geopolitics. Produced and narrated by Carnegie podcast producer Hewan Park and Noah Gordon, Carnegie's acting co-director of the Sustainability, Climate, and Geopolitics program, the six-part series looks at farmers' revolts in the Netherlands, cattle laundering in Brazil, lab-grown meat in San Francisco, the United Nations' reluctance to talk about what meat production does to the planet, and more. I found it a great listen, and hope you will too. Find it wherever you find podcasts. Hi, I'm Annalise Riles, professor of law at Northwestern University, anthropologist, and host of Everyday Ambassador, a new podcast that peels back the curtains of high-stakes diplomacy and gives everyone backstage access to the most powerful methods of leadership. On each episode, we'll break things down into deceptively simple moves that everyone can make to help build a more peaceful and sustainable world. So join me and become an everyday ambassador on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. Karim, I want to ask you to walk us through the options that are on the table now for Israel, for Iran, and for the United States. Um, so let's begin with Israel. The government is under pressure from the U.S. not to escalate in its retaliation, and they may not want to open a second front while fighting the war in Gaza. At the same time, they're also under pressure from their own domestic far-right hardliners to show strength. What do you think are the options on the table for the Israeli government right now? Uh, Israel is in a very difficult position because, as I mentioned, it's surrounded in the region with Iran's proxies and Historically, when they've tried to take military action against these proxies, whether in Lebanon or in the Palestinian territories, um, it's oftentimes backfired and that whatever group they're hoping to um, eradicate or weaken come back stronger uh, a few years later and emerge from the rubble. Um, I, I think that um, in my view, at the end of the day, the the best hope for um, stability in the Middle East is a different government in Iran. And an Iranian government, I'm not necessarily even saying, you know, ideally it it's, becomes a democratic government, but even a government which um, changes the organizing principle from, you know, revolutionary ideology, death to America, death to Israel— to simply the national interests of Iran, um, I think that's the most important uh, factor in, in the possibility of bringing stability to the Middle East. And I would always keep that in mind um, if I were an Israeli official. And you certainly wouldn't want to do anything uh, like take military action inside of Iran that could have the intended effect of further entrenching, um, you know, these uh, hardline revolutionary forces inside of Iran. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, I want to ask you about the options on the table for Iran, and you've talked about them a little bit already, um, you know, mentioning soft targets, Israeli targets outside of Israel. But I sort of want to take a step back and frame that uh, question to be a bit broader, because What we're hearing a lot these days is that no one wants a war. Nobody is interested in escalation. Is Iran interested in de-escalating the situation? I think Iran doesn't want to escalate within their borders, but they're happy fighting Israel down to the last Arab. Um, you know, I, I don't think Iran weeps for um, uh, Arabs who, who die fighting Israel. And... Um, I think if you were to go before the leadership in Israel and say, okay, um, if you could push a button, what would be your ideal scenario with Iran? They would say, we would love to have a normal relationship with the government of Iran. We would love to see a government in Iran which is either democratic or representative or, as I said, simply a nationalist government rather than this revolutionary government. That would be Israel's ideal scenario. If you were to 
pose that same option to the government of Iran and say, okay, what's your ideal uh, scenario with Israel? They would say, we don't want Israel to exist. Have we, haven't we made that clear? For 45 years, we've been trying to replace Israel with Palestine. And so I think that Iran has been very committed to that ideology. And even, you know, if they get their nose bloodied with Israel and Israel launches attacks against Iran, I don't see that ideology changing until you have a change of leadership inside Iran. But as I said, I think, you know, the next time they go after Israel, um, it usually involves that element of surprise and in places where they think Israel may not be paying attention. Now, for the U.S. government, Iran tends to be a pretty partisan issue here, mm -hmm. uh, one that we talk about a lot in an election year. Yeah. Um, at the same time, there is, I would think and disagree with me if you think I'm wrong, but quite broad bipartisan consensus that Americans don't want to get entangled in another conflict in the region. So what do you think are the options on the table for the U.S. government here? What can they do uh, in response beyond what they've already said and done? And how is U.S. domestic politics likely to affect their response? Yeah, when I first started doing this work a couple of decades ago, I thought that Iran was perhaps one of the few issues in which there was a bipartisan consensus, and, and that applied to Israel and, as well. And now, like everything, it's become much more partisan and polarized. But I, I do think there at least should be a broad, uh, broad bipartisan consensus on Iran in that I think when you see public opinion polling in the United States, um, most Republicans and, and, and most Democrats have a very unfavorable impression of the Iranian regime, which is which is natural. You know, their official slogan is death to America. You know, they are a misogynist regime and tolerance. So there's very few redeeming qualities they have. So on one hand, I think both parties um, have an unfavorable impression of Iran. And as you said, after two decades of conflict in the Middle East and Iraq and Afghanistan with little return on investment, uh, the vast majority of Americans also want to avoid entanglement in another regional conflict. So in some ways, when you take that combination together, the policy that comes out of that, in my view, is somewhat similar to the containment strategy we had toward the Soviet Union, certainly in the 1980s, which is, okay, um, we didn't shy away, certainly Ronald Reagan didn't shy away from denouncing the Soviet Union as the evil empire and voicing support and, and more than just uh, oral support for, for Russian dissidents. So that was part of it. There was also arms control deals with the Soviet Union. So that's something that um, you can do with an adversary. You can have nuclear deals. And we also um, tried to uh, strengthen our allies and partners against the, 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 the Soviet Union and, and contain them. And in my view, that should be uh, kind of the template for a modern-day Iran strategy, whether it's Democrats or Republicans. Um, but unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. It's become a highly partisan issue. Karim, I wanted to ask you about the, the factors and the players that we're missing in the discussion on this issue right now. And you've already brought up one of them. You've already mentioned Russia earlier in our conversation. So now, of course, I have to prompt you to speak a little bit more about the role of Russia in what we've seen over the past few days and where they might take this. Sure. Uh, you know, for me, it's a historic anomaly that... America and Iran are fierce adversaries, <clears throat> and Iran and Russia are great allies. It doesn't make any historic sense, because historically, Russia has had a predatory relationship with Iran. It annexed large chunks of Iranian territory in the 19th century. It tried to do that again in the 20th century. It annexed uh, uh, part of Iranian Azerbaijan And you know who it was that came to restore Iran's territorial integrity? It was the United States under Harry Truman. And so, um, in my view, the Russia-Iran relationship doesn't make sense in the context of Iran's national interest. It only makes context. Uh, it makes sense in the context of Iran's revolutionary outlook, which is basically they're willing to partner with anyone who who shares their uh, shares Tehran's antipathy for the United States. So. 
you know, years ago, 10 years ago or so, we would say we would have thought of this is just kind of a partnership of convenience between Russia and Iran. But the more both countries have become isolated, the more they've come to rely on one another. And I think Russia perhaps didn't take Iran as seriously before, but now Russia has played a, I'm sorry, Iran has played a key role in helping to arm Russia and their war against Ukraine. Um, there's now there's news and intelligence reports that how, how Russia is, you know, likes to incite Iran and, and even now has developed relationships with Iranian uh, proxies. Obviously, Russia and Iran played a, a key role in preserving the rule of Bashar Assad in Syria. And so that moves me to the next country, which I'd like to talk about, which is China, because Russia and China are oftentimes lumped together. But in my view, they have divergent interests when it comes to the Middle East. I think Russia benefits from from chaos and instability and the interruption of the free flow of oil and energy because they want to, you know, they want that risk premium of oil prices to go up and, you know, they want the world to rely on on their oil and gas. Um, they're happy if Middle Eastern oil and gas is taken off the market. I think China has diametrically opposed interests. You know, China imports more of its energy from the Middle East than any place else. It wants to see that free flow of oil, the free flow of trade, and they want to see stability. And so right now, um, you know, of the countries that can play a, 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 an important role in avoiding uh, a major regional conflict, obviously the United States has won because the United States has major influence, you know, potentially restraining influence over Israel, the United States can also help deter Iran. But no country has more influence over Iran these days than China. China, um, uh, Iran is incredibly reliant on China uh, economically and strategically. And if the Chinese say to the Iranians, listen, khalas, uh, we've had enough, you know, cut it out. You're now really risking our interests. Um, and, you know, we may think about uh, uh, cutting our, our oil imports um, you know, I think China, would, uh, certainly uh, uh, Iran would, would have to take notice. So we're getting towards the end of the show. Uh, and I really want to ask you, your answers have been so rich and so nuanced that I'm sure our audience wants to read more. Mm. So what are some books, papers that you would recommend uh, people read right now to learn more about the situation? Sure. You know, I couldn't choose just one book. So I wanted to quickly offer three books. And the first is uh, by a friend of mine called Abbas Amonat, who is the preeminent historian of Iran at Yale. And his book is just called a modern history of Iran. And it's a long book, so I have it on, on my Kindle. Um, and it's also a wonderful audio book uh, read by, um, I think, a Shakespearean-trained British oh, wow. uh, uh, actor. And so Iran and Modern History is a terrific book. There's a wonderful book on revolutions by the, uh, the author is Jack Goldstone. I think it's just called a uh, very short introduction of revolutions, which is a terrific book, which applies not just to Iran, but other countries which um, um, have undergone or may undergo revolutions. And then uh, finally, I think the best book uh, that I've read on radicalism is just is, is called The True Believer by Eric Hoffer. And uh, I think also perhaps your compatriot, he was German-American. This book came out maybe in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. But I think, you know, to this day, I found it to be the most incisive book in explaining the mindset of, of radicals. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Karim, it was a real pleasure to have you on The World Unpacked. We look forward to having you back on the show in the future. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. You have been listening to The World Unpacked, an audio production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Views expressed are those of the host and guest panelists and not necessarily those of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Subscribe to Carnegie Podcasts on popular podcast platforms such as iTunes, Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at thecarnegieendowment.org. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, Mira Varghis produces the show and Clarissa Guerrero is our executive producer. I'm Sophia Besch. Thanks for listening.